one of the things that we're looking at it as a Chamber of Commerce and, and everybody's alluding to it is um, updating our strategic plan. One of the things that I think is facing the Chamber industry is that um, we can't expect as uh, Chambers to continue to do things the same way, the way we've always done them, and uh, get a new result or get a growth result. And so we're looking at updating our strategic plan, doing some reinvention. We have a new audience that is going to be um, up and coming, and they don't necessarily want their parents' chamber of commerce. And um, they are probably more interested in playing disc golf than uh, traditional golf outings. And so looking at the trends and the positioning and where we need to be, and using that word nimble, uh, what do we need to be looking at, at trends in the industry to make sure that we are working on our five uh, competencies, core competencies, core competencies, that word's hard for me to say, which is um, one, strengthening um, the local business climate, representing business interests to government, promoting and building a strong community image, uh, leadership development, and then providing opportunities to create commerce for our members. Um, and probably an overarching theme of advocacy in there, which kind of brings up the, the next topic. So the first, you know, the chamber industry is changing, and, and what does that mean for our members? Um, the second one, uh, there's a new political landscape um, at the state and federal level, and advocacy is a huge portion of what we do as a chamber of commerce. And um, what does that mean? Um, even the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tom Donahue, the president, is kind of asking himself the same question. Um, he hopes that it means, you know, uniting around a common mission to uh, create jobs and uh, lift all incomes and grow the economy, but um, time will tell. We do expect certain things on the horizon at, at the state and federal level, tax reform, regulatory reform, um, those would be two big ones. Um, and there's lots of bullet points underneath all those. Um, we expect minimum wage, um, at least on a, on a state perspective, to be um, an issue that comes up with the um, Iowa legislature this year. Uh, the chamber will be voting on its legislative agenda um, today and tomorrow from the exec and, and full board perspective. Um, and we anticipate that our chamber board of directors will take the position of a statewide minimum wage, no local minimum wages, um, that that is really the um, antithesis of uh, encouraging investment and economic development. Uh, a new employer doesn't want to come into a state and wonder, you know, what county to the next county uh, he's going to have to be paying his employees. Um, so uh, no local municipalities have setting individual uh, minimum wages. We expect that to be an issue. Uh, as well. Um, some other uh, particular regulations that um, impact us locally. Um, we have a, an airport that has three flights a day. We hear from our business community that one of their biggest challenges is air service in our community. Uh, and, and we're so grateful that we have our, our three flights a day. But one thing that is really impacting uh, the air, uh, airline industry, the air service industry, is the pilot rule, the 1500 hour pilot rule. Uh, it's creating a pilot shortage, and just like we hear about workforce being a issue, an ongoing issue, which we will continue to hear, uh, no matter the sector, it's also true um, in the aviation industry as well. There are um, pilots retiring, and there not not enough new pilots coming on, uh, and the 1500 hour rule makes it very hard for a, a new pilot coming in to get those 1500 hours, and then wait for an entry level position that is. Uh, the sort of dollars that they don't uh, think after putting in that kind of time uh, that they want to, uh, they look at other uh, career opportunities. So, um, in fact, um, since the 1500 hour pilot rule was enacted in 2013, 52 airports in the United States have lost their service completely. 52. Um, and we certainly uh, want to do everything we can to make sure that we're retaining air service in our community. So from a federal standpoint, that will be a huge issue. Um, the overtime rule uh, is an issue that it doesn't matter if you're public or private, it doesn't matter if you're a small business, a big business, it affects every single employer, chamber included. Uh, and so that is a, a regulation um, that we believe will be on the table as well. Um, some parts of the Affordable Care Act, 
uh, it has been on our agenda for the past several years wanting meaningful reform. Um, some of the taxes, the excise tax, the medical device tax, those sort of taxes, uh, mandates on businesses. Um, and uh, to, to Kay's point, um, President-elect Trump had in his campaign mentioned, oh, we're going to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and now that has uh, kind of changed to we're going to look at parts of it. And he's identified that there's parts of it that indeed are good. Uh, staying on until you're 26 in the pre-existing conditions. Um, we're a non-partisan chamber. We are, are policy driven. Uh, one of the things in 2017 that, um, that the chamber will be doing uh, that we have never done before is endorse candidates. Um, and this was a board decision that was carefully thought out. It was uh, discussed, it was debated, it was researched. Uh, we looked at best practices. And the board of directors felt that it was important that the business community had a voice on candidates uh, and letting our members know, letting our business community know which of the candidates um, are in alignment with the chamber's agenda. Uh, so their candidate endorsement process, uh, we won't do our first endorsements, it'll be the, the election next year because we are in the process of developing. But, uh, that will be a big part of, of what we're looking at too.